good afternoon to all of you, uh, and hello again since this morning. <coughs> this is um, a somewhat tense moment because uh, it's the first time I do a TED style talk, so I was trying to think about how to do that. Um, and one of the funny things is that you know we were talking about it before, and we realized I don't have a title for it. But uh, anyway, title is something like pulling together for the energy transition, and we'll see how that works in terms of the um, the uh, the content. You'll be the judge of, of whether it whether it fits or not. Um, I was also a little bit stressed out because usually TED Talks, uh, you know, from these people who are very much at ease about walking around on the stage, you know, floating about, having all their points in their head and just giving them freely and whatever it is, I, I do need a little bit of support to at least keep the thread of what I'm saying. The advantage is that I now have a perfect pretext for staying here because I have to be looking at the, well, not looking at the camera, but at least in the picture. All right, let's get going. Um, do you know what um, a haka is? Those of you who follow rugby should know, because uh, the New Zealand rugby team regularly f performs a haka. Um, and uh, well, it's maybe not such a good idea to talk about the New Zealand rugby team right now, because they lost resoundingly against England yesterday, apparently. But still, uh, these hakas are something that are worth watching. What I'm going to be talking about is a waka. And a waka is also from New Zealand and is also Maori, but it's a war canoe. And the reason why I'm mentioning the war canoe is, uh, first of all, because I have it on my meeting room table in my office, and I use it as a metaphor for teamwork and how we manage challenges together, because everybody sits in the canoe, everybody has a paddle, sit next to each other and then behind each other, and they all pull as fast as they can in hopefully the same direction, because that's the whole idea. So it's really about everybody pitching in with their individual strengths, and with a common purpose. And um, the reason why I kind of picked on this is because uh, there is a link, obviously, to what I, I'm going to get to in a minute, but it's also because I am so extraordinarily happy about how, the, how I work together with my team these days. I started about a year ago, and we were a team that kind of uh, focused mostly on seeing you know, which energy projects to do and how to finance them and how to do the financial management and how to organize that with the agency and so forth and so on. And we're getting to the stage now where we have one discussion after another about how is it that we can actually work together towards getting the technologies where they need to be, which is far more relevant in terms of where we are than just saying, well, we have another project to manage, let's see the call, that we get the call right or that we get the financing right and so forth and so on. All right, so that's the idea. Uh, it's about how do we pull together in the context of the energy transition. And uh, the reason why this fits in very nicely with our overall package here, our overall discussion, is because we are coming from an era where it's really very much um, about everybody having their own kind of idea, everybody pulling in their particular direction and looking at their individual profit margin, whereas we now are, um, you know, and you know, looking towards shareholder value or whatever it is, whereas we are beginning to realize now that the approach we are following actually is um, breaking the planet or to put it a little bit less provocatively, um, that we're not even close for the moment to being able to include externalities in how we calculate the risk and the cost of what it is that we're doing. And so the whole purpose of how we work in our economy more broadly and in the energy context really is shifting and should be shifting. And in that sense, really, purpose does not mean losing individual action or contribution, but it really means developing a far closer idea of what a common understanding is of what it is that we're doing. That's the challenge we are, we're in for. This is what I keep telling my team as well. It's everybody has their own strengths, their own ideas, their own things to bring into it. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that it gels and that it flows in a direction that is useful um, to everybody. So it's a bit like this waka canoe that I was talking about. Imagine that you have a bunch of rowers in their canoe, and they've just collected a lot of food, and they've collected a lot of materials for their village, which allows them to kind of build up their village and strengthen the way they, they operate economically, and so forth and so on. But they're being pursued by a sea monster, and that sea monster is really picking up speed. So they decide that the only way in which they can speed up themselves is by uh, throwing some of the stuff that they have on board overboard to, to lighten the weight of the, of the canoe and uh, to, to increase or reduce the drag in the water and so forth and so on. Because 
after all, they say to each other, you know, this has worked before when we were doing the canoe races, right? As soon as we threw some of the weight overboard that we still had in the canoe, all of a sudden we were faster, right? Only then what they see is that the monster eats the food they're throwing overboard and gets even more energy and gets even faster, so it's catching up with them. So they realize that they're actually doing the wrong thing. They are feeding the monster, which means less food for their village, and they're not really getting away from it, because no matter how hard they row, the more food the monster gets, the faster it becomes as well. So the, they decide that this is maybe not a good track to follow, that in fact what they should be doing is they should be rowing harder, they should be letting the sea monster get hungry and weak, do some dodging maneuvers and whatever it is, and lo and behold, they actually succeed. The sea monster weakens, it kind of sinks below the surface, and the villagers get back to the coast, and they can deliver the food, they can feed their families, and they have the materials that they um, need for building houses and for building more canoes, more wakas. So voila, coming to, back to our conundrum, I think you can see where the analogy kind of lies. We have three challenges for the way in which we need to look at our energy transition. The first one is stop feeding the monster, which is global warming, or greenhouse gas emissions, whichever way you want to look at it. Tr not throwing you know, the good stuff that we have overboard and actually making the problem worse than it is. The second thing that we need to do is we need to feed the village, which is an analogy, as you can imagine, for energy security and energy supply. And the third one, we need to bring the materials that allows us to build the tools in the village which allows to improve living conditions, which is both about competitiveness, but also about growth and jobs, making sure that uh, the villagers themselves can survive and can survive in optimal conditions. So the work we have really is dictated by two specific needs. One is get the food and the materials to the shore, and um, the other one being the urgency to get away from the climate change monster. And central to this, of course, to this whole idea, is the principle of the waka. We need to get everybody on board, get in, into the same canoe, start rowing, and start rowing in the same direction with the same purpose. And those of you who were there when uh, we had the panel this morning will recall that I had a number of, of things that I thought was, were quite essential there. The first thing is that it's not just about individual technologies, but it's about bringing those technologies into an energy system that is coherent and effective. The second one is that we will need an inordinate amount of effort and particularly an inordinate amount of investment to make sure that we get the curve for the energy transition. And there again, it's not about uh, looking at, uh, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, this is, this is a public sector job, so you know, um, we need money from the EU, we need money from, money from national governments and whatever it is. It's really about getting everybody who has the capacity to invest, to invest in the right things instead of the wrong things, pulling in the same direction. The next thing, of course, also, which is, again, trying to pull things together, get uh, more purpose into the system, is something that for those of you who work in energy projects and in developing technologies is to get the same idea into the system, which is that it's not just about getting the project. It's not just about writing a proposal which will make sure that you get funding. And then when the project is over to think, oh, whoa, it's running out, I need to write another project. It's about making sure that the project itself actually delivers for what it is supposed to be doing, which is decarbonization, improving energy technologies, cleaning up the energy system. And this is very much a common challenge. Um, again, I refer to this, I think, this morning. One of the things that we see now as a central job within my team is to make the link between the outcomes and the impacts that we want to have in the context of the energy transition and what we are going to feed into the next uh, phase of what we do in terms of research funding in the EU, research framework program. The next one's going to be Horizon Europe, as you know but to really make that link between what is the desired outcome and what do we want to come out of the research framework program results. So writing work programs, writing calls, which are all as directly targeted towards the outcomes that we want to get. Voila, so in a nutshell, this is what it is. It's all actors need to work together, need to uh, link investments to research, to building the energy system of uh, tomorrow. So voila, my message to you is, 
Let's get into that canoe. Let's start rowing, because the monster is already on its way. <laughs> voilà. Hey, uh, my name is Piotr. I was wondering, what if there is another, another waka, this, the waka that wants to row in the similar direction, but with different people, for instance. It's a waka of different country that wants to uh, invest in hydrogen, mm -hmm. and it still wants to be sustainable, but in a different way than other wakas. Who's, who's deciding on that? But that's that's okay, no. Um, I think the, you, you, the one thing you that said, would you said, yeah, you said that we should get on the yeah. one one waka, and, yeah, but I and also, the world has different ways of of approaching the same problem, right? But what I also said is, you know, the interesting thing is that about in every uh, in I mean, you know, analogies in any case they always go as far as they go, and at some point they break. I mean, that's why there are analogies and not the real thing. But uh, but uh, to be a bit more serious about it, uh, what I said is you know you get into the waka you get rowing but you contribute with your individual strength everybody has a different kind of effort that they can put into it and maybe also a different skill set with regard to rowing some can row really strongly others are better at handling the paddles in such a way that you can get minute steering corrections or whatever it is and if you have two or three or four wakas it's the same thing the teams will be bringing different things to shore one will focus on having caught fish, the other one will have hunted something else, or they will have brought grain, for, or whatever it is. So um, it, it all depends on uh, the individual contributions that everybody has. And I'm not saying this because I don't want to uh, acknowledge that there are different pathways, but more because we will need most of these pathways concurrently to get to the energy transition. So having uh, a hydrogen waka <laughs> will be interesting to see how that works. But anyway, um, having a hydrogen waka doesn't contradict one which has wind energy. They are complementary. So that's, that's really the story. But the tricky bit, and, and that's what I said also this morning, is going to f be to find out um, how they interact, where the emphasis should lie, and that emphasis uh, will depend very much also on where you're looking at. So you might have four wakas going to two different villages. Well, the villages might need different things. The main thing, though, is that in both cases, they don't throw their food overboard and get the sea monster to gobble them up before uh, they, they, they get to the goal. You see? Thank you very much. I would like to ask you if you think that people realize themselves what is needed to do, or if sometimes people need to be pushed to do the right thing? Yeah, I would, uh, I prefer nudging rather than pushing. Uh, and that's, that's also a management thing, by the way. But, um, but the, uh, the example I can give you is we had a uh, citizens' dialogue last year in April uh, which kind of fed into the European Sustainable Energy Week, which we did in a city close to Brussels, uh, Louvain-la-Neuve. And we met with, I would say, about 150 citizens there. And the only thing I can say as a criticism, if you want to see it as a criticism, which it even isn't, is that there were so many ideas about different things to do in terms of sustainability and uh, decarbonization and so forth and so on, that it was difficult at the end to draw conclusions that were kind of crispy, if you will. Um, but the interest is there. So I think that uh, pushing is probably not the thing, but dialoguing, yes. I had a conversation um, at some point today with one of you, don't know whether you're in the, yes, you're there. We had a conversation about um, how do you get citizens to participate in um, uh, the development of smart cities and things such as, for example, positive energy buildings or positive energy blocks? And there's a whole, there's a whole can of worms, that story, because it's very difficult to see how you can convince citizens to do that. But what I referred to was that we have a project, which is still an FP7 project, if I recall correctly, called Citizen, which does things that are called roadshows. And these roadshows, are aimed at communities, they go over there, they talk to these communities, and they have three, four, five meetings. And these meetings are typically about how do we plan that energy transition or the transformation of our district together. And that's, there's a whole lot more of that kind of stuff that needs to happen 
if you want to make sure that we get all the citizens on board in addition to all the social measures and so forth and so on that need to be taken, but it's not just that. Or to give you another analogy, we have uh, something called um, energy regions in, coal regions in transition. And that is not just a title or a description of a situation, but it's actually a package. And in that package, what we do, and interestingly enough, we get complimented at the global level about the way the EU approaches this, is that it's about discussing with the areas where you have a very strong coal component in their local industry to have an open and very strong discussion about how they want to move forward in the context of decarbonizing and how you can do that whilst making sure that everybody comes out of it better and not worse. And it's, it's a long-term thing. It's not just you know, having a few discussions and then going with something and then forgetting about it, but it's really something that, uh, that has to be built over 10, 15, 20 years. So voila, this is my answer to, to the question. I, you have to make sure that you, you take people with you. Thanks. Yeah, my question is a bit adding to her question. Now, what if the villagers realize that they are feeding the sea monster, but the people rowing do not realize it? But, so, in, so to speak, the people who make the decisions do not realize the importance of not feeding the monster, but they still do it. Yeah, well, then we're in a bad place, no? <laughs> Would be my answer. I'm not sure that that's the case anymore now. Uh, but what, what there is, in my view, what is the case is that there's a whole lot of still old groupthink going on. That, yes, that's for sure. But that the awareness itself is not there, I don't think so, somehow. But anyway, my analogy, of course, is, is works only that far. I mean, if, if, they, if they don't realize it after a while that they are, <laughs> they are creating a problem by throwing the food overboard, well, yeah, they, <laughs> the waka disappears. But worldwide, you believe that uh, most of the countries or the uh, yeah countries are moving in the same direction. The impression I have is that there's a lot more good stuff going on than we imagine, uh, or than than, than it looks like. Uh, you, you know, typically when you have people who say, "Wow, you know, here in Europe we're only 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the rest of the world is much more, and the Chinese are pumping so much CO2 into the air. You know, it's not worth doing anything, etc., etc., etc." They don't realize that there's actually an enormous amount of work going on in China and in India, for example. And, you know, we had this discussion about micro microgrids, no, uh, over lunch uh, in Africa, where there's a whole, uh, whole thing in terms of leapfrogging for energy systems that's going on. So, um, again, I don't think that the realization is not there, but there's a lot more that needs to be done to get those operators that have an opportunity to get technology into the systems um, realize how much benefit there is, not just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but economically in moving in that direction as opposed to another direction. And, you know, the good examples are there, but we need a lot more of them. Hello. Uh, I'd like to have your point of view about uh, the future of uh, nuclear energy in, uh, in Europe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, good, good point. Okay, listen, I'm going to give you the, the official line, which is uh, nuclear, as well as CCS, um, as well as, to some extent, uh, gas is going to be part of the way in which we do the energy transition. Um, and the less official bit of it is that at some point, hopefully, we will be moving out of nuclear as well. But it's a very, very difficult kind of proposition to make because depending on which country you look at and which energy system you look at, um, it's easy to say we're going to get out of nuclear or at least reasonably easy because, you know, even in countries that have dis taken that decision, which, you know, close to here is, is the case, for example, um, it's, it's not all that easy. Um, but in other countries where there's a, a significant part of the energy system that depends on nuclear, it's a whole lot more difficult to do. Um, so I, I don't think the case is closed, and I think that there still needs to be a discussion on it. And in any case, with all the scenarios that we, we've built, there is uh, 
there is this problem of the residual part of the energy system that you can't decarbonize either quickly enough or you can't decarbonize at all. And the only way in which you can handle that is by providing some form of extra types of, of energy. I mean, uh, somewhat less controversial subject than nuclear, but which is also there, and I mentioned already, a CCS, carbon capture and storage, which it's very likely we're going to need in one form or another as well. And you know how difficult the public debate uh, on that one is, depending on which country you're, uh, you're looking at. So, a bit of a mixed answer, but for the time being, it's there, and I don't see it completely disappearing from the European map for the time being. Hello, my name is Hubert Put. I'm from Inner Energy Lisbon community. Uh, thank you for your speech. It was really, really nice, and I listened to it with pleasure, but I have one question to you. Uh, you said that, okay, it's going worldwide, the processes that uh, many people don't know about, or the scale of the process is much more that the society's thing. But the thing is that it's not so worldwide, I think, because, for example, some people from some countries, like uh, the politicians, basically from far right side, they say, like, okay, they built, the, for example, Europe. Europe built their future on fossil fuels. They had the time for industrial revolution. They had the time for everything. Now we want to develop to live on the same level as, mm -hmm. as we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they are gaining popularity because people say like, okay, we want to have, everyone wants to have electricity at home. Air conditioning, um, let me say no blackouts. Mm -hmm. So how can we, startups, students, uh, entrepreneurs from different fields, corporations, politicians, lobbyists, contribute to make it even more worldwide, the energy transition, as ever before, to minimize the effect of such people on their society's minds. Thank you very much. It's a big question, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was supposed <laughs> to be a big question. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, let, let me at least try. Um, I referred this morning to wind energy, offshore wind in particular, where, for me, it's been obvious that the strengths that we've built up in terms of wind technology, wind energy technology in Europe, make us super competitive worldwide. What this means is that even in those countries where they are still developing, for example, coal plants in order to build up their energy networks and whatever it is, there is a good part of the economy that's looking at what can we do also in terms of renewables to at least minimize the extent to which we have to rely on fossils. All of these countries could benefit from the technology developments that we have. And, you know, the, the possibilities are there for, for the grabbing. But that's for the wind energy industry, which is already, you know, pretty mature at this point in time. But the same thing goes for um, new types of technologies. Uh, again, I refer to the discussion we had about microgrids. I think that's, that's one uh, thing where typically I think that there, there would be huge opportunities for either startups or smaller companies or groups of smaller companies to really uh, bring technologies to areas which need it and where actually the development of microgrids that depend on renewable energies is a really viable economic solution as opposed to saying we're going to build a massive power plant but then we have to build 2,000 kilometers of uh, electricity line in order to be able to supply uh, the, the electricity to the small communities that depend on it. So again, I think uh, the main thing is to try and develop these technologies as quickly as possible, get competitive in them as quickly as possible, try to get them out into places even outside Europe as quickly as possible, and uh, try and contribute to the energy transition in an economically sensible way in uh, those areas as well. It is a workable economic proposition. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, all of the countries on the globe with, is it the exception of two, I think, are part of the Paris Agreement. So they all have a commitment, one way or another, to decarbonize within a certain time frame. So they are working on it. Whether it's fast enough or not fast enough is a, is a different debate, but they are working on it. So what we are gaining as experience and as technology advancements here in Europe can be beneficial to, uh, to those countries. And then there's a, a last argument in this uh, thing as well, which is you know, one of the challenges for the new technologies, particularly the deployment of technologies um, for the energy transition in Europe, is to scale up, to reduce the costs, to get them to market. The more you can rely on additional markets to Europe, the faster this is going to go. 
Yeah, we have very good examples, for example, in the context of biofuels, where we know that India is very interested in the technologies that are developing there. There are lots of European entrepreneurs who go to India to at least have an opportunity to develop some of their uh, capacities there, and they bring the technology back to Europe. And that, that can happen in a whole range of different technology areas. So that opportunity is there as well. Thank you.